Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us uh, in this ING webinar. Um, over the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of drama and turmoil in Europe. And, uh, but of course, we shouldn't forget that also things are happening in the rest of the world and that political developments over there can have an impact on European business. So with the US uh, presidential elections coming up and still a lot of uh, discussions with China, the Chile relationship between Trump and China, I think it was a perfect occasion to focus on some of uh, these developments. And that's the reason why I've asked uh, three of my favorite colleagues to join us today and to talk about these topics. And on the one hand, we've got Rob Carnell, who is our chief economist Asia Pacific uh, for ING, and we, we, who will tell us a bit more on the perspectives uh, for Asia in the post-corona world. Then we've got Aris Pang, our chief economist for Greater China, who will focus on trade relations uh, after the US elections. And finally, we've got James Knightley, our chief international economist, who is based in New York and who, of course, will tell us a bit more about the US elections. So let's start with uh, James. Uh, we know that uh, he is living in the city where uh, that never sleeps uh, and uh, unfortunately for him it's now i think 2 30 in the morning but he's uh, alive and kicking joining us so james um uh, talking about the u.s elections i see that joe biden is leading very comfortably in in the polls uh, and also in the swing state so that's uh, will, will it be an easy walk for him uh, or could we see a return of, of, of Trump in the next few months? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, well, perhaps if I just move on and show you a couple of, uh, of slides about this, because as you say, Peter, uh, Donald Trump is behind in the opinion polls. Uh, Joe Biden has around a, a seven percentage point lead nationally. And you would think ordinarily that that would be more than enough uh, to win the election. But you've got to remember, Hillary Clinton won the popular votes uh, by more than two percentage points in 2016, yet still lost. Um, it's not a straight add up all the votes and there's your winner. It's about it, the, the Electoral College. And this is very much a state by state battle. And what you've got to do is, is win the states with the big populations, but actually also win pretty broadly. So what we've got here is a slide uh, showing you the result of 2016, because as you can see, while Hillary Clinton won the, the, the states uh, on the coasts, which uh, tend to have big populations, she didn't do very well in the middle of the country. So that's what we've got to really uh, acknowledge. It's not just a straight, you know, Joe Biden seven percentage points ahead. It, it, you've got to factor in this additional uh, layer of, of, uh, of, 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 of complexity, if you like. Um, and so what we find also is that within the Electoral College, um, the numbers that you get per, per state don't necessarily represent the population side. It's meant to be a good proxy, but of course, uh, the Electoral College hasn't kept pace with population change. So what you find is that the high density, uh, very populous states, such as California uh, and, and, and New York, which have seen very rapid population growth, well, those populations have grown far more quickly than their electoral college votes have. So what you find is that states in the center that Donald Trump has got a, um, a, a large holdover tend to carry more weight uh, retrospectively. For example, in California, there is 790,000 people per electoral college vote. In Wyoming, it's only 193,000 people. So again, that weighs in favor of Donald Trump is a key reason why he got re-elected, well, why he won the election in 2016. So that sort of framework just sort of, it just makes it a more challenging backdrop for the for the Democrats in the first place. Um, and also, therefore, we've got to remember, you know, there are key battlegrounds because we know uh, that New York and California are going to vote Democrats. We know Kentucky and we know that Wyoming are going to vote Republican. There's only about five or six states that really matter in this, that can actually determine the election. And we've got those here. Uh, there's Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Florida, and Arizona. Now, the good news for Biden is that he's ahead in all five of those. Smaller majorities than on the national front, uh, national position, but it, it's looking at the moment pretty good for him. And you would have to say that Biden is the overwhelming favorite to win. 
but we've still got time. There is still uh, key issues to battle over. And of course, the COVID response, will we get a vaccine that could give Donald Trump a bit of a lift? There's the economic backdrop. The economy is bouncing back pretty well. Unemployment is falling quite quickly. That could give Donald Trump the argument, well, COVID-19 wasn't my fault, um, but I'm dealt with it and I, I'm, I'm generating jobs. But then, of course, we've also got a lot of uh, issues still coming through. The Black Lives Matter, the protest movement we're seeing in many cities, that is creating a sense of concern about law and order. And again, that seems a strong suit uh, for Donald Trump. So I, I wouldn't rule him out, um, put it that way. Um, I still think Biden is the most likely uh, winner, but uh, that is a big factor. I would also just say one other thing. The other big issue that could be supportive for Donald Trump is the likelihood of significant numbers of mail-in ballots. Uh, because of the COVID crisis, a lot of people don't want to queue up in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, you know, in a polling queue uh, with lots of other people. So this idea that lots of people do a, a postal vote or mail in their ballot, um, that could cause some issues because, of course, Donald Trump's trying to undermine that because there's been various polls by the Wall Street Journal and by NBC here uh, that suggested that 50 percent of Democrats are wanting to do a mail-in ballot. Only 10 percent of Republicans want to do a mail-in ballot. So if Donald Trump can put people off or he can, he can discredit it or, or use legal frameworks to try and, uh, you know, basically lead to an earlier cutoff in terms of when postal votes can count, that could also uh, stand in his favour. So long story short, uh, lots of issues that could still support Trump, uh, but in general, we would still imagine that Biden is, is clearly the favourite in here. Okay, thank you, James. Perhaps first also um, something practical for people who are willing to, to ask a question during uh, this webinar. The, there's a possibility to put your question in the chat function. So put your, just put your question in the chat function and we'll try to come back to it at uh, the end of, of during the webinar. So uh, James, perhaps uh, following up on, 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 on the first question, um, yeah, if... Uh, Donald Trump turns out to be the comeback kid, I would say. Uh, what, what, what could be the consequences for, for policy and, and for the markets in general? Yeah, um, I mean, perhaps if I just contrast where the two camps are, I mean, you couldn't get two more different campaign policies. I mean, we've got uh, higher spending, higher taxes from Joe Biden. We've got lower taxes, less regulation uh, from Donald Trump. You know, the, the, those that regulatory issues are huge divergence. You know, Joe Biden wants much more regulation of financial services, of big technology, of energy. So it, it, it's it, there's, a, there's a very big difference in, in, in how they are looking at things. And of course, also, as you say, about international uh, positions as well. Uh, Joe Biden is much more of, a, of an internationalist, historically speaking, um, whereas, of course, uh, Joe, uh, uh, Donald Trump is, is very much the opposite. So if we look at a, a Donald Trump victory, um, how much he can do really also depends on the elections that are also going on in the House of Representatives and the Senate, because it's fine Donald Trump saying, well, I want my policies to be this, but they have to get voted through in Congress. And if he hasn't got control of the House, which he almost certainly won't have, uh, the Democrats will, are, are pretty certain to retain control of the House. Uh, that makes things difficult. As we've seen, you know, over the last few weeks, the, the, the difficulty in trying to get another fiscal package through, it, it's just gridlock. Uh, but also, additionally, the problem for Trump is that he could lose the Senate as well. The Democrats could gain the Senate. They only need to win a net three seats. Uh, and that is distinctly possible. So the problem for Trump is this. He, if he wins by some, you know, real surprise, um, then he's going to be very constrained in terms of his policies. He's promising tax cuts. He's promising less regulation. Well, that's fine. He just won't be able to get them through Congress. So that leaves him with this problem that he's probably going to have to focus on the areas that he can get stuff through by presidential decree. And that basically means international relations. And if you are left as a, you know, with four years to do something, what are you going to push for? Well, you're going to push your Make America Great strategy again. And that does suggest intensifying battles with international partners. 
Uh, we've already know that he's pulling out of the World Health Organization. We already know that he plans to pull out of the World Trade Organization. And you can almost be certain that he will plan to step up his attacks both on China and on Europe. So we would imagine uh, very quickly uh, in the early part of next year after he realizes that he's not going to get any of these payroll taxes cuts through uh, and he's not going to get his big domestic agenda through in a meaningful way, uh, he is going to be focusing much more on those external relations issues. Uh, and that, again, you know, the return of the trade war, more tariffs on, on imports, again, the tool that he prefers to use that he thinks is very successful, um, is likely to be coming back through. So that does suggest uh, in that environment more dollar strength. That's the key thing that we saw over the last couple of years when you see these trade tensions mount. It also reinforces the view that interest rates are going to be pinned to the floor, that we're not going to see any rate hike from the US Fed until at least 2024. And moreover, there's a very strong chance that he will likely um, remove Jerome Powell from the head of the Federal Reserve. He, he's not a fan. He thinks that the Fed, you know, are not should be much, the Fed should be thinking much more along the lines he thinks rather than being independent. So you could well imagine him trying to get someone in who's more amenable uh, to his policy views. But again, the problem is how are you going to get that, that person through Congress if you don't control Congress? So there's issues there. Um, now, you know, we're not going to get see many tax changes. We might see some mild looser regulation domestically. Um, but I guess, you know, we're going to see less chance of a big domestic fiscal stimulus because, again, the Democrats and the Republicans are just going to be at loggerheads. So that's perhaps a bit of a bad news story for, for, for the economy, actually. You know, you're going to get a combination of more trade war, more tr anti-trade uh, rhetoric coupled with a lack of domestic stimulus at a time when COVID-19 uncertainty remains very, very high. So it could be quite a tough uh, environment for the global economy, but also for financial markets as well. There's a lot of optimism priced in uh, for equity markets in particular. But if you get this scenario where Donald Trump is really constrained domestically and has to go much more aggressive on China and European relations. I think that could be a much more troubling and dangerous environment for, for financial markets and would likely, as I say, lead to much more dollar strength. Okay, James, thank you. Perhaps before turning to Aris, we, we got already some questions that, that, that I would like to add. The, the, the first one is whether Trump will also turn against Europe because we know that uh, uh, Trump backed away from imposing tariffs on, Euro on European cars, but if he would be elected, would that be something, uh, would, that we, would we also see a kind of trade war with Europe? And uh, you also uh, answered uh, more or less the question on the dollar uh, in terms of, 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 of Trump, uh, if Trump wins, but uh, what would it mean uh, for the, what, what, how would the dollar behave uh, in, in the case of a Biden win? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Our foreign exchange team do believe indeed that, so that the risk off environment, uh, the uncertainty that it creates and the historical precedent that we've seen with how trade war escalations have really supported the dollar reaffirms that view. So we've moved up towards, you know, 118, 119 on, on euro dollar. We could see the dollar uh, come back a little bit um, on the back of that. Um, as for relations with Europe, yes, I, I do fear uh, that we could see uh, Donald Trump's uh, attack on uh, international trade uh, being broadened out, not necessarily just focused on China, being much more of a global theme as he tries to really bring jobs home in an environment where, you know, we've still got 13 million people who have lost their jobs net since February. That's a huge number of people that are out of work uh, and he wants to correct that. So I do fear that we could uh, see more tensions, particularly on aircraft. The Boeing Airbus tensions could really pick up in light of uh, what we've seen recently, uh, more tariffs on, on lots of other little products as well. But we could start to see him go after the car industry much more aggressively. He's been warning about that. Of course, the economic arguments are that, well, what are the biggest American car producers? Well, they're the European firms. The BMW plant in Spartanburg in North Carolina is the biggest car exporter in America, exporting SUVs to China and the rest of Asia. So actually, you know, by putting up tariffs on imports from those parts, it actually harms American workers and harms uh, American exports as well. But again, you know, economic rationalization doesn't really come into this. This is very much shooting from the hip uh, in Donald Trump style. So I, I do fear um, that uh, the case for the economics is going to get overwritten by the politics. 
Okay, James, thank you. Um, so James has been talking uh, a lot also on trade tensions, tra the possibility of further trade wars. But remember, we had one with uh, with China and there was this phase one deal where China actually promised to buy a lot of stuff from the US. Uh, and uh, so Iris, uh, is, is that happening? Iris, you're on mute, mute, you're still on mute. Aris, you're on, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me turn the slides to, um, yeah, this one. Um, I would say that Trump has now two wars with China. One is the trade war, which could be deal with the phase one trade uh, deal. And the other one is the technology war. On the trade deal, I think believe that I still believe that China wants to complete the phase one trade deal but because the first half of 2020 there are there are too many things that have happened for example COVID there are uh, also uh, trouble and also other restrictions so um, confirming on the deal and and on uh, buying more from the U.S. has been a little bit difficult. And then even more difficult is that yesterday, WTO confirmed that U.S. imposing tariffs on China is improper. So after yesterday, I believe that the phase one trade deal could be a little bit, could, could face a little bit more hurdle than before yesterday. And if you look at the chart, actually you see that um, the contribution of uh, China um, trade, no matter it is exports or imports, it is almost all about electronic products or mechanical products, that means machineries. So this actually doesn't match with the US-China phase one deal, which is more on um, farming, farmers goods, farming products. So this will have an unmatched of what China really wants and what US really wants. This is something that we are looking at it. And you can see that um, after COVID, on the right hand side of the slide, after COVID, the imports and exports of electronic products have increased from a contraction. So um, this is something that we have to be uh, very uh, mindful before because the same thing has not happened to imports and exports of agricultural products. So um, I, I would say that um, my view has changed a little bit after yesterday's WTO um, uh, decision. So it is a little bit more difficult for China to complete the deal. But I still believe that China wants to complete the deal, but it will defer it further to nearer the end of 2021, which is the deadline of the deal. Okay, Aris, but there are not only the trade tensions, there's also the kind of technological war. I think of Huawei, I think of TikTok. Uh, so how do you think that this technological rivalry or war between China and, and the US will evolve? Um, technology is a very broad topic. It could be software, as you pointed out, like TikTok, or it could be hardware, just like what you pointed out, Huawei's 5G products. On Huawei's 5G, on, on, let me, let me uh, tell you this. China is very good at software. For example, TikTok, WeChat, Alibaba, these are all software. Online media platform, online shopping platforms, they are very good at it. And they have the best first mover advantage. So I, I am not really worried about how China can tackle the overseas pressure on TikTok or other, other um, uh, apps, I would say. But the worry is on hardware because China do not manufacture advanced technology hardware. Uh, they rely on not only the US, but Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. What Huawei is doing now is that 
they are redesigning the 5G products so that it is 100% made in China. And all the um, suppliers of Huawei has stopped all the production because the design has been different and the products they will provide to Huawei will also be different. So they have stopped the production. Now Huawei said that within six months, around six months, then uh, they can they can reproduce and then uh, 5G um, products can be on the way. And this actually only defers the 5G of China uh, selling 5G products to overseas for, for six months. But the pressure, as James pointed out correctly, the pressure is actually politics, not economics. So if we looked at um, the slides here, we see that there is a V-shaped rebound in profits of all the technology related sectors and industrial robot output is also on the rise after COVID. So this actually tells us that China is going to be more rely on domestic demand for its own product or for its own 5G, for its own robots, for its own automobiles and computer equipment. And this is actually um, uh, very dangerous for exports because it means that China exports to US will also shrink because China also exports a lot of finished electronics goods to US, though some of the parts come from US. So this is something that will change the way that global global change, trade will, uh, will perform. Okay, thank you, Aris. Uh, to, uh, yeah, perhaps let's let's draw uh, Rob into the conversation. Rob, uh, if if the U.S. Uh, like Aris is suggesting will will buy less technology, less semiconductors from uh, from China, less high tech in general from China, will this open up opportunities for Asian companies out of China? Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, you'd like to think so. Let me just take you back to this slide here with little pictures of factories and things on it. Uh, which I, help, I think helps to explain this a little bit. So this is a complicated um, subject, and Iris has, uh, has given us an opening into this. Um, but let's, uh, in order to really get our heads around this, I think we have to understand that there are very different types of firms involved in this. We'll figure out which ones China has and which it doesn't. So we're really only talking about the, the advanced um, semiconductors here, which are going to be critical in the manufacturing of some of these you know, very, very sort of high, high tech um, bits of kit. Um, what China has, uh, for the most part, is what we call down in the bottom of the middle, pure play foundries. And these are basically semiconductor fabs, just churning out semiconductors to a specific design. Um, if you like, it's a sort of big semiconductor sausage machine. So China's SMIC would be a, a very good example of this. But they don't always have the ability to design the semiconductors themselves. They can churn them out, but if they had to come up with a sort of brand new, you know, really state of the art one, they'd be reliant on the designs from other places. They've got a basic sausage recipe, let's say, but if they wanted to do something really fancy, they'd need to get it from elsewhere. And they would typically go to, over in the bottom left, what we call the fabulous companies. And these are dominated hugely by US companies. Uh, these don't produce, but they design uh, the, the, the sort of new, the future of the semiconductor world. And this is what China really needs to get its hand on, these designs, in order to then produce, if it's not actually going to be able to buy the chips themselves. So the companies involved here, US firms like Broadcom, Qualcomm, NVIDIA. So the US isn't going to be, be giving China the design for these things, at least that's the, the sense that we're getting uh, from the US right now. So what else could we do? Well, there is an alternative in the region, and that would be some of these integrated device manufacturers. So these are companies like uh, like Samsung, for example, um, within South Korea as well. We've also got SK Hynix. Uh, then there are a bunch of uh, US firms as well, like, uh, like Intel, uh, Micron, Japanese firms, Toshiba, and let's not forget uh, Texas Instruments, which don't just make pocket, pocket calculators. So they could, they could ask these firms to fill the gap but it's a bit more complicated than that because um, you know, the US is basically telling these firms, putting a lot of pressure on them not to sell the types of chips and certainly not to sell the designs 
for those chips to China. And of course, if you think about all the, the other stuff going on there, the interplay of military support in the region, um, then, yeah, you'd, you'd probably think there's going to be a lot of arm twisting and backroom stuff going on uh, to prevent these guys from stepping in and filling the gaps. Now, that there's another point here as well, which is you don't just need um, the designs um, uh, for, for these things or the chips themselves. Often you need the machinery to make the chips. And there's only a couple of uh, firms globally that do this stuff. This is very, very sort of niche area. Um, and uh, so Applied Materials is one firm. It's a US firm that does this. But you need things called ultra photolithography machines, which I can just about say. Uh, ASML, Dutch firm, also does this, Tokyo Electron. Now, recently, ASML uh, was put under a lot of pressure by the US government not to sell any of these machines to China as well. And I believe that they've so far held off on this. And there's one other little aspect as well in all of this, which is important. You, you don't just need... You know, to do this stuff, you need pretty smart people, people who really know what they're doing in this area. Now, China has got some very smart people, but do they know everything they need to know in order to, to do these manufacturers, to design these new chips? Well, probably not in the numbers that they need right now. So that's why I've drawn these little pictures of brains uh, every now and again. And so, uh, as James will, will doubtless be able to, to back up as well, one of the other things that the US has been doing, it's been closing its doors to work permits for people from China to go and work in, you know, the very limited number of firms which either produce or, or, or make these things or in the academic institutions that do the research for these things. So work permits, student visas are also being, um, being closed down. So none of this stuff, as Iris is saying, is, is likely to stop China moving forward. Um, what it does is it probably prevents Asian firms on the sidelines from really taking a, a bigger role and filling the gap that a U.S. embargo would fill. And in the end of the day, it probably is more about, from a U.S. perspective, delaying tactics, delaying the inevitable, perhaps, um, than actually stopping China moving ahead and, and developing this sort of new infra, new um, technological self-reliance that it's, it's pledged that it's going to do. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, before going further, let me just remind uh, the participants in the webinar that they still can ask questions via chat. We still have someone, but we, we are going to place them a bit further in the discussion. But if you have any new ones, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat and we'll try to come back to them. Uh, but turning back to Rob, um, uh, Rob, let's, let's say in the in a surprise win uh, of Donald Trump in the U.S. presidential elections, or in in the case that Joe Biden wins, but he doesn't ease up uh, in terms of relationship, in terms of trade relationship uh, with with China, how would this play out for for Asian countries? Will they take sides, or, or what will happen? How will they position themselves in this kind of new difficult environment? Um, positioning is very, uh, you know, for the, for, the, for the countries themselves, if this is a question of um, how, how do they position themselves in a world where there's pressure, still pressure from the United States on them, um, but also, you know, on the other hand, China isn't, you know, there are tensions within Asia with China as well. It's difficult. I mean, it always all, all comes down to a lot of politics, really. I think most countries in Asia don't want to have to make the choice. You know, they're, they're quite comfortable with the notion that there's the U.S. Navy basically steaming through the South China Sea occasionally uh, with perhaps a bit of backup from uh, from the Australian Navy, providing that sort of sense of, of uh, independence and calm. Um, but knowing that they're that from an economic perspective, from a commercial perspective, China cannot be ignored. I mean, you just can't turn your back on the single biggest market in your region. So all of them want to make money by having close economic cooperation with China. But at the same time, I don't think anyone really wants to turn their back on the US and say, OK, China, we're, we're on your side now. Now, there are a couple of nuances here. I think the Philippines has recently shown that it's prepared um, to, to welcome some of the soft power projections that China has been making in particular. I mean, what the Philippines needs right now is a lot of vaccines. Now, we're not really sure whether the Chinese vaccine works or whether it's safe, but I mean, I think there are certain countries within Asia that are prepared to just give it a try. 
And China is prepared to provide uh, vaccines to the Philippines and perhaps to other countries as well uh, in the region. Indonesia might be in the market for that as well. So it's doing its best, as it's always done, to try and pull countries away from that sphere of influence uh, from US politically. Um, but at the same time, you've got stuff happening like uh, with the boundary disputes with India. India is well and truly, I mean, it's fully on the US side. It will be looking to them for support. Uh, and it's historically, traditionally always been at loggerheads with, with, uh, with China. Uh, and then you've got a whole bunch of them in the middle that just don't really want to tell you what side they're on uh, or not. I think Singapore would be one of those that would like both sides to believe they're on both sides. Um, at the same time, which I think you, you, you kind of can't do now. Increasingly, there is pressure to choose here, but it's a terribly messy business. Uh, and I think most of them are going to try and defer making any firm decision on, you know, politically which side they, they end up on uh, than another uh, until it's absolutely clear that they have to make a choice. Okay, Rob, but uh, which, let's, let's just assume that the trade hostilities between China and the US continue after uh, the US election, which which Asian countries would would benefit from it or, or, or which countries would be most vulnerable to such a kind of continuation of a trade war between China and the US? Okay, uh, that, that sounds like a, uh, an extremely straightforward question. I've got a slide on that actually, I'm gonna to turn to it now. It, it turns out to be anything but a a very simple question. In fact, I'm going to talk through two sides. Let's start with this first one, which has the sort of radar map on it. Um, so if we look at the left hand, the vertical Y axis, what we've got here is countries, uh, Asian countries exports to China as a percent of all their exports. And then on the horizontal uh, X axis, we've got uh, Asian countries exports as a percentage of GDP. So, for example, if you were a country that exported everything to China that you exported but didn't really export very much at all, very closed economy, uh, you'd be somewhere in the top left corner of this chart. And it wouldn't really be uh, you know, that much of a disaster. If you were a country that was hugely open but didn't export anything to China, uh, you'd be down in the bottom right corner. And again, you wouldn't be particularly perturbed. So where you really don't want to be is in the far right corner or somewhere sort of pushing out along that orange line, that orange arrow, uh, because then you'd be not only fairly exposed to a, re uh, a resumption in the trade war, uh, but you'd also be very exposed to, in particular, demand coming from China on the assumption that this was going to have some, uh, some negative consequences for China. So very obviously, Hong Kong is in the crosshairs here as the outlier. And I think you know, no, no one would particularly argue with uh, with that sort of an assumption. Um, but then there are a couple of countries that don't look in great shape either. Again, Singapore doesn't do terribly well, although it's not super directly connected in terms of trade directly to China. I think indirectly, um, a lot more of its trade does go to China than is, is suggested by these charts. Um, and also, it's a very, very open economy like Hong Kong. It's a big trading hub uh, in the region. And then you've got a few others just sort of inside uh, the, uh, the the concentric circles. They would also be relatively exposed. Taiwan, lots of trade directly with China, a lot ver very open as well. Um, Malaysia is becoming more and more of a big trading region. And of course, South Korea and increasingly Thailand these days. If you wanted to say, where would you be safe in this environment? And I, I think you need to put, you know, big uh, inverted commas around the word safe. You'd probably choose somewhere like uh, India, or Indonesia. They, they don't do a lot of trade directly with China, and also they're pretty closed economies as well. But it isn't really this simple. I was, uh, I'm, I'm myself, we were talking just a moment ago about technology. This might end up being more of a technology war than just a straight trade war. So let's have a think about uh, technology and go to the next slide. Um, so what we've got here is a, a, a bar chart showing who's exposed potentially to a tech war. Uh, and again, it's a it's a difficult picture to really nail down. So right at the top here, we've got the Philippines, um, a surprise winner, if you like, or loser in a tech war in terms of uh, the the amount of its exports, which are dedicated to electronics, is over 50%. It's huge. Um, the only thing is, they export having not done a great deal to those electronics while they're in the Philippines. It's very low value add uh, 
uh, in the Philippines. There's a lot of testing, a lot of packaging, but not a huge amount of, uh, of real value added going on. Um, so in some senses, yeah, their export numbers would crash, but in terms of GDP, it probably wouldn't have that big, a, big of an effect. And they're probably importing quite a lot of the, the parts before they get exported. So yes, the, uh, the, the net export side would look awful, but GDP probably wouldn't be that big. Taiwan, on the other hand, yeah, big effect uh, would happen there. It's both a very substantial part of GDP, also a huge part of trade. Malaysia, likewise, South Korea. Um, Singapore sort of up there as well, but perhaps not as exposed uh, as, uh, as those other three I just mentioned. Uh, again, if you want to say where would be safe, uh, and again, inverted commas, you pop down to the bottom, uh, India, Indonesia. Now, interesting, Vietnam, which gets mentioned so often in all of these things, um, doesn't look too drastically affected. But you know, actually, bear in mind that uh, you know, as a percent of GDP, that's still quite a chunky amount. Um, so they're actually doing quite a lot of value added in, uh, in, in Vietnam now. And those numbers just only grow as, uh, as time goes on. There's, there's a lot of movement uh, into, into Vietnam as well. So that could also be another area. But, and it all very much depends on how China responds to this. You know, because it could be, and I've suggested that there's, there's an environment where Asia doesn't really benefit from a, a tech war because it wouldn't really be able to get involved. But clearly companies are diversifying throughout Asia uh, and some of them might be able to benefit as a result of that um, by, uh, by more movement uh, into them. Uh, you know, Vietnam's a very obvious case in point. And if China starts pushing very strongly on its, on its new infra projects, it could well be that actually, you know, whilst there's a trade war going on, these guys are able to capitalize on that and are able to move into it. It's a terribly wishy-washy answer, I know. On the one hand, I'm saying, yeah, it's difficult because the US is going to make it very hard for anyone to get involved. But at the same time, um, it's very clear where China's ambitions lie. If the US doesn't give it access to this technology, it's going to look for it elsewhere. And Asia is tremendously well placed to provide some help in that if that's the direction it's going to go. And if all the US's politics do is to slow it down. So it could be that this still ends up being a good news story for the tech producers, albeit that the short term might be a little shaky. Thank you, OPS. In the meantime, there are still questions coming in via chat, and you all, all already more or less answered this question, but perhaps just some additional information. There was a question on if, if uh, and the, the US is more or less blocking the further technological development of China uh, in, in some way, uh, uh, which, which, which countries in Asia will be the, the, the beneficiaries of that, we, which countries can step in this gap uh, and will be the technological winners? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one, this. I mean, the, there are state-of-the-art leaders in this, and I would say South Korea is at the top of that. I mean, they are, uh, in terms of semiconductors, in terms of mobile telephony, in terms of some of the, the 5G, um, you would have to look quite hard to find countries that, would, that were more advanced uh, globally than South Korea. Taiwan is way up there as well, um, but perhaps not, to, not quite to the same degree. I mean, a lot of the other countries that do electronics within Asia are part of very complicated supply chains. Um, but their supply chains that are becoming, if anything, a little bit... Um, I'm not sure it's less complicated, but they're becoming less obvious in the sense that you don't just produce in in the place where it's always been cheapest. You know, in the in the old days, you just produced everything in China, uh, as Iris will confirm, because it was cheap to do that. But you know, 20 years of roughly 15% nominal wage gains every year quickly stops you being a cheap place to manufacture. Then on top of that, you put um, you know, the tech war, then on top of that, you put um, COVID-19, trade war, and all of a sudden people are thinking, all right, okay, well, we, we like China because it's a huge market for our stuff. We don't want to stop selling to them, but maybe we don't need to have all our eggs in one basket. So what you do then um, to try and uh, think, you know, who, who might gain is, like, okay, who's close to China, both geographically and sort of economically, um, and who's got good infrastructure? Uh, because in the end, if you're not going to be locating your production in a country, you want to make sure that you can get your manufactured goods back to it. That's, that's what's happening these days. We're not making in Asia to sell to Europe and the US. 
Yes, we do to some extent out here, but increasingly we make in Asia to sell to China. China's the big, big sucking noise of demand that we get in the region. So if you're not producing for them, um, you know, you, you don't really need to bother. So there's a couple of countries that stand out in terms of infrastructure building in recent years that are really beginning to capitalize. And again, Vietnam uh, comes out here, deep sea ports uh, being created, uh, but also Malaysia has been doing uh, some of that as well. It's, it's trying to rival Singapore as a, uh, as a trading hub. Uh, and Thailand as well, its Eastern Corridor is, is also aiming to, to build up its infrastructure to become a place where you can manufacture and then re-export back to the big demand centers within Asia, not necessarily back to the rest of the world. So those three stand out as being, um, you know, Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, do stand out as being the three that are most regularly mentioned as benefiting from a, a sort of tech war in, in the longer sense with a relocation and a, and a sort of shuffling up of, of, of supply chains within the region. Okay, thank you, Rob. In the meantime, there's still a number of questions on the US, but before um, returning to, to James, uh, perhaps uh, uh, one additional question for Aris, because uh, Rob just mentioned the new infra uh, scheme in China. Uh, I think uh, most people don't know what it is. Perhaps you can give uh, a, a bit, uh, bit of an explanation on that. And also um, on, on the 5G, uh, evolution in China, because if the, if if now 5G is evolving less rapidly than foreseen, will this have an impact on this new infra scheme? Can you comment a bit on that? Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, so this slide shows you the new infra scheme. So new versus old. What is old? What is the traditional? The traditionals are bricks and mortars, for example, railways, um, toll roads. Those are old and real estates are old, but new infra, all of them are about technology in some way or the other. The first one is 5G infrastructures. But let me tell you that although I bracketed it, say that some delay, um, most of the major cities in China, city centers in China has already have connection to 5G and their 5G mobile plan is very cheap because the government has set an upper limit of the 5G mobile plan to the same as the most expensive 4G mobile plan. So it can't be more expensive than 4G. So this is really cheap for Chinese consumers to shift from 4G to 5G. And this shift is, is intentional. The government also wants that when there are more and more consumers shifting from 4G to 5G, then there will be more apps designed for 5G, more new things to be used with 5Gs. And this is intentional by the government. And there is more big data centers. This one is completely new after the outbreak of COVID because during the COVID, the governments actually experienced that big data is very important to not only to trace the people that could be infected with COVID, but with other calculations, for example, transportations and also uh, uh, even wet food markets. So these are things that is very important uh, experience from COVID and they are now building more big data centers to grow for the future. The most important thing and most difficult thing from the difference of 5G is AI and industrial Internet of Things. Although these can be um, completed without 5G, they can be run on 4G, they can be run on local connection, but with 5G, there could be a lot more possibilities and a lot more efficiency. So this has been delayed and we don't know how long this, can, this will be delayed. For example, Huawei said that their design will be delayed by six months and then the production will be delayed and then further and further. So AI and industrial internet of things will be delayed maybe for uh, maybe the most advanced uh, things to be happen will be delayed for one year. And then, and then because of all the big data centers, they need more electricities 
can you still imagine that there is a there is a place that need more electricity than than need less electricity? China is one of them. So because of all the big data centers, all the 5G connections, they need more electricity and therefore ultra high voltage connectors. And these connectors are believed to um, waste less electricity in between when they connect one to each other. So they are considered to be something green. And then high speed rails, because cross provincial uh, high speed rails are not come completed for the whole map of China. So they have an ambition to complete the whole map and then electric car charges because they expect that there will be more EVs than traditional combustion vehicles in 10 years. So they need more electric car charges. Now the street lights is now also the electric car chargers and there will be more of them. So these are the new infra screen scheme I would say that even China is now facing the hurdles from US. The political tension, the political pressure, for example, Rob's mention of ASML, not to sell to, to China, even China has already placed the orders. I don't know what to do about the contract, but so many pressure, it actually press China that it has to be self-reliance. Otherwise, it will be always be under political pressure on this subject and it cannot grow. So it's, it's something that China is, I will expect that in the coming October meeting, that the Chinese government will state that to be self-reliance on technology is the top of the agenda because they can't be blackmailed by any others continuously, month by month, years by years, that they can't have a uh, grow on technology. This is something that I imagine about this government. They say that they will do that. So, um, yeah, and yes, hi. Um, Peter, do you have another question for me? Um, perhaps later on, uh, Iris. But but let's let's now uh, turn back to uh, to James. Um, uh, if he's still awake after his fifth coffee or so, James, <laughs> uh, in New York. Well, let let's turn back to the uh, to the U.S. presidential elections because there were still more questions on that. Uh, if uh, we 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 talked about uh, the, uh, a surprise win uh, of Donald Trump and what would happen in that case, but uh, let's just uh, consider the other extreme that uh, Biden wins by landslide and that wins by landslide and the, that the, the Democrats also gain full control of the House and the Senate. Uh, would this be good news for the world and for international trade relations? Interesting question. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, I mean, as I said earlier, I mean, the contrast between Donald Trump and Joe Biden couldn't be more stark in terms of their taxation, in terms of their regulation, in terms of international relations. They're so far apart. And you would imagine that if Joe Biden does win by a landslide and he gets control of, well, the, the Democrats retain control of the House and they win the Senate, then basically he can get through anything that he wants. He'll have all three key uh, areas of government under their, under Democrat control. And you imagine, as a result, he can get those policies through. So what we are looking at is uh, sharply higher corporation taxes. We're going to be looking at higher uh, capital gains taxes. Uh, we're going to be looking at more regulation, as I said earlier, particularly for big tech, you know, much more, uh, not, not as aggressive as perhaps in Europe in terms of uh, personal data, et cetera, but certainly moving in that direction. Uh, regulation of energy as well. Donald Trump, again, huge differences in terms of energy policy. Donald Trump still very much on the uh, on the old sort of fossil fuel uh, support. Uh, Biden wants much more clean energy, and he's looking to invest upwards of $2 trillion in green energy uh, over the next few years. And that's another route uh, for European companies to perhaps enter uh, the US much more. Because I think, uh, as I said earlier, Joe Biden is much more of an internationalist in terms of his uh, views. Uh, he's much more pro-trade. Where it comes as an issue, as both 
Iris and both Rob have uh, alluded and I mentioned earlier, uh, the politics of though is very important, particularly in regards to China. Uh, and I, I completely agree with what Robert, Robin Ice was saying. Um, it's not just about bringing jobs back to America, it's about America's uh, dominance of the global economy and the, the, the politics of the world over the next 20, 30 years. And they fear that China's rise with technology would be a big constraint in that, because of course technology is the future, and technology is going to what is going to be what drives defence uh, and military activity uh, over the next few years. So that is critical for America's sense of um, uh, you know leadership, um, shall we say? So it's not yes. I think in terms of trade with China, we're going to be seeing perhaps tariffs rolled back, but. Um, he's not going to go easy uh, on China. I think what we would see is instead of tariffs, which is, of course, are paid for by American consumers and American businesses, Chinese businesses don't pay them, um, we're probably going to see more fiscal support, perhaps, for companies that are looking to bring plants back uh, to America, such as through tax breaks or, or, or grants or that sort of thing. So I think that's where the trade side matters. But certainly technology, there will be no let up in terms of uh, the US's attitude uh, towards China and gaining technological advantage um, over the US. Um, in terms of Europe, uh, I am much more encouraged. I think, you know, Joe Biden keeps talking about his Irish roots. Uh, I think that's a trouble, a problem for the UK and Brexit. And what we're seeing here, certainly here, uh, a lot of congressional members very unhappy about uh, what uh, Boris Johnson and the British government are doing. So certainly I think Joe Biden will be standing up uh, much more for Europe. I think also uh, he'd be much more consensual and be looking to work with Europe um, to, to try and get change within China in terms of uh, intellectual property protection and that sort of stuff. That was something that I, I think uh, has always been, as I'm sure Peter, you can add something on this, been sort of seen as a, a strange position from Donald Trump is why not work with Europe uh, to get change in China? You're much more likely to have success if you get the two big export markets for Europe, uh, for, for China to, to express a desire for change and try and force uh, some change in terms of the way China uh, behaves. Um, that is that I, I would suggest that's the route that we're going to go down. And that could potentially yield more than the, the trade war scenario that Donald Trump has been really pushing. Uh, just in terms of financial services, it'll be interesting to see if Elizabeth Warren, um, who of course was one of the Democrat challengers earlier in the year, if she gets a significant role. Um, she of course wants to see significant uh, financial um, uh, change, you know, much more pressure on the US banks. And that would be an advantage for European banks because uh, the competitive position of European banks versus US banks in their domestic markets is very, very markedly different. Um, so the US banks are in a much better position. And that, that could be interesting as well for European uh, banking groups as well. So it puts them on a more level uh, playing field, shall we say. Uh, but in general, we'd be looking for a tax and spend Biden. Um, and that would, of course, mean bigger deficits. But, you know, we're going to be seeing higher taxes in the future. And there is the potential that, yes, in the near term, it may be slightly dollar negative. It may be slightly equity market negative because we're not going to get tax cuts. We're not going to get less regulation. We're going to get tax hikes and more regulation. Uh, and that could be bad news for some uh, key U.S. corporates. So uh, I would imagine the knee jerk reaction on a Biden uh, clean sweep of the House, the Senate and the presidency for the Democrats would be equity markets underperforming relative to a Trump victory and the dollar uh, coming off as well. So more euro strength. But as I say, if the Biden presidency can generate growth, big stimulus coming through uh, in all likelihood, if that can get generate growth, if we can get growth, uh, if we can get more positive news on the global trade backdrop, that too um, could also support uh, economic activity. So I would imagine knee-jerk sell-off of the of, of the US dollar and also of equities. But medium to longer term, uh, I think that we could actually see a, quite a good environment um, for, for equities uh, and for the US dollar as well. James, meantime, there have been some questions also on, on the green agenda. You know that in Europe, uh, let's say the European Commission is putting a lot of emphasis on a green agenda for Europe. Now, in the case of a landslide uh, of Joe Biden in the US and Democrats gaining control of both the House and the Senate, 
uh, how would this green agenda look like, for example, would they be joining the, the Paris Climate Agreement or, or do you think that they, that they will, would go very far in this, in this green agenda in the US in terms of uh, if, if, if Biden wins both uh, the presidency and the Democrats, the, the Congress? No, it's a very key area and um, he's discussed putting in quite a key political heavyweight uh, to really push this. There's a lot of talk that John Kerry, for example, a former presidential uh, challenger for the Democrats uh, and also Secretary of State, he could actually be given that role to really re-emphasize re how important uh, climate change is. And with all the wildfires that we can see on the West Coast um, of the US, again, the, the market attitude difference between Trump and Biden couldn't be starker in terms of climate change and the impact on the US. Again, we've got hurricanes hitting. There's five hurricanes queuing up uh, in the Atlantic to hit the US over the next couple of, well, next few days and weeks. Um, so the combination, there's a growing acknowledgement that this really is a massive issue. So Joe Biden has proposed spending up to $2 trillion um, over the next four years. That's quite a, quite a big fiscal push very aggressively. Uh, and they've got a 100% clean energy electricity standard by 2035. So yeah, that's uh, that's a remarkable turnaround from where we would be if Donald Trump um, retained the presidency. So much more pro green energy, certainly uh, joining rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, and actually possibly doing very very you know mark, trying to lead the charge on that as well. So again, that perhaps creates opportunities for for some European European companies in that, given that there's going to be a lot of money thrown at this. And there's going to be some radical change coming potentially if, do, if Joe Biden does indeed win. Yeah, James, but we didn't consider the case, of course, where um, Joe Biden wins the presidency, but the Democrats are unable to win both uh, the House and the Senate. Uh, with in in this constellation, would it that easy for Joe Biden? Uh, would Joe Biden to come up with the kind of policies you you just mentioned? There's more of a challenge, obviously. Uh, you're going to have to build cross-party support. But I would imagine with Joe Biden being much more consensual, he's uh, you know, trying to return American to norms of political behavior. Um, there are certainly lots of people in the, Demo in the Republican Party um, that uh, are amenable to that, are certainly viewing that that is, would be a good thing. That would be a good direction for the US to move in after the last four years of you know, pretty pretty aggressive, um, you know, discord between uh, the parties. So certainly there is a moderate wing, definitely a moderate wing of the Republicans, uh, you know, the likes of Mitt Romney, et cetera, the, or, or John McCain before, you know, you know that sort of, sorry, they, the people of that kind of mentality uh, in terms of this, you know, America needs to return to uh, its global leadership. It needs to return to, to something um, of what we used to see America as. So I think there's certainly options. It would certainly limit the scope for an aggressive fiscal stimulus. It would limit the scope for big, big tax hikes. It would limit the scope for massive regulations. So actually, you know, it, from that, from a financial market perspective, it may be seen as, you know, a relatively okay thing. Um, but certainly I, I do think that there are, there is room and, and certainly energy um, and, uh, and, and climate change is an area where there are a lot of Republicans that uh, do not buy uh, Donald Trump's line. So I, I'm not as concerned, you know, Donald Trump, if he, uh, you know, he, there's no way that he could work with the Democrats, uh, given what we've seen over the last 12 months. Uh, that would be my real fear. You know, we, we could see real aggressive, no real breakthroughs domestically, and it's left with an international agenda. I think Joe Biden has a much greater chance of working with uh, opponents, um, uh, and, and so I, I, I'm not unduly concerned. Uh, obviously, it's not going to be as big a thrust of his policy mix, but certainly he can work very, very effectively with Republicans that are on the moderate side. Okay, thank you, James. Uh, perhaps uh, coming back to Iris, uh, as, as an investor, I had a question, uh, because uh, you mentioned the delay in the 5G uh, network, uh, but at the same time, there's, uh, and also the tech war, of course, which could hamper uh, Chinese technological development. But at the same time, uh, Chinese demand uh, is, in domestic demand, is, is still very huge, very important. Would we have to look also at, uh, let's say, at companies uh, satisfying domestic demand? Uh, I'm just thinking of food, beverage companies and the likes. Or do you still think that the Chinese tech is the way to go? 
Um, for hold on a second, I'm uh, picking the slides. So um, on this slide, you can see that I have uh, segregated three um, parts: the promising sectors, the stable sectors, and the dismal sectors. So still, I believe that technology related sectors inside China is still very promising. They are still growing. So uh, for example, yesterday, Alibaba announced a new business line, which is uh, an AI plus big data for factory manufacturers is called um, information rhino. If I translate uh, directly from from Chinese, the project is called Information Rhino. So it is um, it is an, just what I said. It is a combination of AI and industrial Internet of Things, combining data with the design of the factory workflows to improve efficiency and uh, reduce wastage in factories. So this is something new in China um, in, in a big scale. So if Alibaba want to sell it to, to every small medium factories, uh, which in that case should small medium factories originally could not enjoy this because they could not develop the, the R&D, the big data, the, the cloud. They can't do that. They have to buy it but they can't buy it from several places. They have to buy it holistically from one, and this is Alibaba now. So this is something that is uh, uh, creating in China and benefiting small, medium uh, factories, which will increase growth of the, of the economy, not just manufacturers. So I still buy the technology thin for the use in China, and honestly, 5G does not use advanced uh, chips. They use just normal chips. So um, 40 nanometer chips is okay for 5G related products and China can produce that themselves. So I don't worry about that. But there, there will be some things that stand out after COVID, which is related to cross provincial troubles. We have seen that in Hainan Island. The island is at the southwest part of China, even southern than um, Hong Kong. That one was designed in the past 10 years ago to be the um, holiday island for government officials because government officials' passports are kept by the Chinese government. They can't go lesser trips whenever they want. They can't, they just can't. So they use Hainan Island, a different weather, a very warm weather with beaches, with all the resort style hotels, very luxurious things. All of them are in Hainan Island. And now because of COVID, Chinese people can't travel abroad because of the quarantine, the 14 days quarantine, they can't uh, travel abroad. They, all of them fled to Hainan Island in the in the past month uh, during the summer holiday, and we see increase in cosmetics and jewelry spending even within China. So they are themselves pretending they are going to they are going overseas, but they are actually staying in China. So, um, but for but for people that live in the north. Hainan Island is something that is very similar to Thailand or Vietnam's luxurious resort. So they have to feel that they are really in overseas. But not for me because I live in the south of China. So this is something that has happened in China and bring back growth in China from within. This is what Xi Jinping called the internal circulation. And it is happening because it creates jobs. The most important thing is that it creates jobs and people with jobs because they have been redundant from factories and now they got the jobs in services they can spend although they spend more money these people spend more money but these are the people they, these are there are lots of these people and if they spend more money the retail sales also being pushed up 
So these are things that is happening in China. And for the middle income class, they are very fond of pharmaceuticals products, not really drugs, but for example, vitamin C to prevent COVID. So, you know, prevent COVID. Vitamin C, I don't know whether vitamin C can prevent COVID, but they are really um, chasing after those vitamin Cs. And um, catering business are in trouble because social distancing measures have not relaxed to the extent that dine-in is possible. Dine-in is still not possible in many locations in China. So catering business are still in a year-on-year -year contraction. But apart from that, for example, takeaway beverages, which is also very uh, in fashion in China. Uh, those are Taiwan bubble tea. I don't know whether you have it, but they, they, the Chinese are very fond of it. So those are takeaways. Those are okay. The, the growth has come back. And then the comeback, the also important comeback is the filming industry. Because the filming industry, just like Hollywood in in US and Bollywood in India, it is a big industry in China, making a lot of money. It is now in a comeback. And if you have TikTok, um, I think you can download the TikTok Chinese version, then you can see movies uh, and, and dramas, episodes in, in TikTok. So um, these are coming back. And this means that more people have jobs and more people have more salary compared to the COVID level. So they are returning to normal. But I don't like the export sectors still. Uh, we have to see whether the US presidential election results will change this landscape. But even there will be changes. The changes will not be immediate in November 3rd or, no or November 3rd. So I think that even there will be changes more friendly trade policy to China. It could happen maybe in the at the end of 2020 or at the beginning of 2021. And so this year, it is not a year of exports. And therefore, for example, the paper industry, which provide the cartons for uh, exporters, they are in this most situation, very, very difficult situation. And um, Technology war is something always in my mind, and this will defer growth of China. And I agree with James that the worries is always on China's military power. And because of this, China is showing even more muscle on its military powers within the South China Sea and flying over Taiwan and also uh, the, the island between Taiwan and Japan and China. And all this means that the technology war is now very politicized and it will not end soon. So, yeah, that's, that's it. Okay. Um, thank you, Iris. Uh, yeah, we still have uh, five minutes left. Uh, bear with us. Uh, and uh, let, let me just uh, take uh, two other questions from the audience to finish. Uh, there's still one important on the US elections, but let me first turn to to Rob, uh, there was also a question on, on Japan, Rob, because uh, when we talked about the winners uh, in in Asia, you didn't mention Japan. How how the country doing? Two minutes. Uh, can you say something? On? Yeah, I mean Japan is uh, is something special within Asia. I mean it's uh, obviously it's a very big economy, but it's one that hasn't grown for a very long time. Um, and what we've just had is a change in prime minister. Same same uh, ruling party, the LDP. Uh, new Prime Minister. Um, uh, Abe has stood down for health reasons. We've got this new guy, uh, Suga, coming, who, who's been one of Abe's right-hand men during this whole process. Uh, I don't know. I don't see anything particularly exciting and new happening in Japan. It, clearly, it's a, it's, it's a big story in terms of electronics. It does well there. You know, it's got some of the world's leading firms. Um, you know, in terms of things like gaming, which is becoming a really important industry in its own right. Uh, I mean, as soon as I say gaming, people sort of go and sort of giggle a little bit. But it's a massive, massive industry now when you think about um, the salaries that are being, uh, you know, uh, earned by professional games and so forth. And Japan is right there. You know, it's a manufacturer of most of the major consoles uh, and, and is, is certainly a, a big player. But 
what are we going to get uh, with the new guy? Pretty much more of the same. And more of the same has only got us to where we've got. Um, there's a little bit more chat about uh, reform measures, structural reforms, but I like to see them. It's a very easy phrase to say out loud. It's a very difficult thing to do in practice and deliver concrete, meaningful changes which will have a useful and uh, noticeable impact on an economy. So I reserve my judgment on Suga. My, my base case is Japan is roughly where it is. Uh, it's not a bad outcome, but he's 77. We're going to get another election next year uh, in September, October, and we'll see then whether or not he's persuaded this party that he's actually there for the longer haul. But for the next year or so, yeah, it's done OK in terms of COVID. Um, so it won't have an, an amazing bounce back as a result, but it's probably uh, you know done as well as many of the other economies in the region. OK, thank you, Rob. And then to finish, uh, there was uh, in the beginning of the webinar, there was an interesting question on the US elections. What will actually happen when it's a tiny victory for uh, Biden, uh, but Trump doesn't accept the results? What will we see then happening? You're on mute, James. You're on mute. James, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just, I mean, we, we've got precedent uh, for this. Um, and this was uh, back in 2000, so 20 years ago, if you remember, whereby it was so close. Uh, Al Gore won a couple of seats by a few hundred, a couple of states by a few hundred votes. But the key issue was in Florida. Uh, Bush won Florida by just 537 uh, votes. And that required a, a state recount. And of course, they kept finding all these postal ballots. Um, and, and that meant, you know, that it kept the league kept moving around. And in the end, you know, the, they, they were just disputing this and disputing this, and it got put up to the Supreme Court. So it wasn't until uh, about 35 days later, on, on December the 12th, that we actually finally knew the outcome. Now, that didn't really result in much economic impact because, of course, you don't get the change of president until January. That's important. It's not, you know, you have the vote and then it's the new president the next day. Um, you've got a good sort of two months, um, you know, for the transition and the handover. And so there wasn't unduly significant market concern. Of course, this time around, when you've got two candidates that are so different and when passions and tensions within the general population are running so high, uh, there is a concern that you could get, you know, protests, violence. You could get, as you say, uh, candidates refusing to concede. Uh, so it could be a much uh, more challenging environment. And of course, this really focuses on on the on the mail in ballots. And as I said earlier, nearly 50 percent of Democrats are looking at mail in ballots, only 10 percent of Republicans. Uh, so that's why Donald Trump is really hammering this. Oh, the, the postal votes are not go good. Don't count them. And different states do electoral law slightly differently. So, for example, uh, some states say that the, the postal votes have to be delivered uh, by 8 p.m that day on November the 3rd, whereas California says it only has to be postmarked on that day. So it could be another week before those postal votes actually come in. Then to complicate the matters, a postal vote, you have to sign it, but also then that has to be, um, you know, corroborated uh, by a separate signature on an ID uh, so you can get it matching up. Uh, so that takes a huge amount of time. So, yeah, I, I think there's a very real chance that we don't get uh, the outcome on the evening of November the 3rd. And this does lead to tensions and financial market tensions. And you can actually see that in, in the VIX index. The futures um, for the VIX index and the forward pricing for that, um, it does suggest that there is a lot of nervousness about significant financial market volatility around November. It calms down again in December. But yeah, I, I, I do fear, uh, particularly with um, the violence that we're seeing, uh, this could be a very, very troubling uh, period. Um, that said, you know, uh, the states will, uh, the individual states have a lot of control over this. And, and Donald Trump can stamp his feet and shout and lot as much as he likes. Um, it, it's determined by the states. He's not got really, really any control over this. So uh, I think due process will prevail. Uh, and yes, there may be noise, a, a lot of concern, but in the end, even if uh, Donald Trump refuses to concede, uh, I think the party 
the Republican Party uh, would stand uh, in the way and say, no, look, we've got to take control of this. This is if, you know, they do believe that Joe Biden has won. So, I, I, yeah, there's going to be a lot of noise, long story short, but I, I think due process will prevail and we will be all right in the end. Okay, thank you, James. We are at the end of this webinar. Let me thank the audience for joining us. Let me thank the speakers uh, for the clarifications. Uh, probably you're still confused, but I hope on a higher level, and we hope to see you back probably after the US elections. Thank you, and have a nice day.